Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with dear friend Gemma Gamby. She's a meditation teacher, spiritual teacher, artist. And she's asked that before we begin, she could say a prayer. Mm. So I've, of course, said a resounding yes. It's all yours. Okay. I'm just going to take a minute to be quiet first. Mm. So may I be present from the most connected place within myself. And may everything that I say and all of my intentions be connected to Elena in a way where truth and purity is able to resonate between us. Amen. Amen. Oh, <laughs> my lady. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to have you here. You, you, like me, worked in fashion for 20 years. You started out as a, as a runway model. Mm -hmm. No surprise there. When you look at Gemma, you'll see she's so beautiful and 8,000 feet tall. You then became a stylist mm -hmm. and then, which I was also, but very shortly, briefly. Mm -hmm. And then you worked in trend forecasting, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that I loved when I was a textile stylist. That was like my favorite part of my, you know, season was oh my god i get to look at all the trend forecasts all those cool magazines with all the little tear sheets and the collages and that was my favorite and then i would get to go and make boards for my company which was just like the best use of my time at that time you worked in luxury you worked in mass market you worked in asia you worked in the us you worked in the eu mm-hmm and then four years ago, you took what was in your heart, I guess, the whole time and became a meditation and spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. And you've been in my space for quite some time because of your relationship with Sasha, your husband, who's mm -hmm. like one of my best friends. And I've interviewed him for the podcast, too. Mm -hmm. I am really happy to have you here because the whole question of meditation has been very much top of mind for the last several weeks. A lot of the people that I've had on the podcast are either practicing meditation or meditation is an integral part of their work, even if it isn't meditation. I've just read a new study that came out on Apple News yesterday of all places that neuroscience is showing that meditation can uh, decrease the age of the brain. Mm-hmm. So I'd love for you to teach me and the listener about all of that, the work that you do, where you've taken it and where you plan to go with it. Mm, yeah, well, for me, the most important um, aspect of the way that I work. So why I started to teach meditation um, was, was from a desire, an experience I had in India when I started to feel my most inner state of bliss. And I realized that if I had it, everybody must have it. And I wanted to be able to let everybody know that they have it and they can experience it and be with it. And right now with my work, what I find most interesting is um, the idea of the psyche. Mm. And when I think and I see and look around and hear people talk about mental health, I feel like they get stuck at the mind where really we have psyches <laughs> yeah. and the psyche is the combination of the mind and the spirit together. And so therefore it's not just finding ways to soothe or help the mind. It's finding the spirit, your own spirit and allowing that to integrate with your mind 
and finding the place at which it integrates. Yeah, so that's a really neat equation, I have to say. I've never thought about that. The mind plus spirit. That mm-hmm. psyche isn't just the mind. It's funny, when I was speaking to Sasha too, we talked about how the whole concept of every man is to get the men out of their cognitive minds and into their hearts and into the rest of their experience emotionally and evolve themselves emotionally. So that's Mm -hmm. very helpful. And for the last four years, you've been teaching Mm -hmm. and strictly in New York or elsewhere? Um, Mostly in New York. Mm -hmm. I started off by teaching because, you know, I had to keep up with fashion in order to make money. So I started to, and because I had such a long career in the fashion industry, I started by working in corporations. Mm. So I set up um, one of the first mindful uh, meditation programs at a um, the largest tech hedge fund in the world and taught there twice a week. Then I taught at a biochemistry research center. Um, I, I started to teach a lot of people privately in their own homes um, and I taught for Adidas. I did programming for them at Basel. Um, and then Ford Motor Companies and a few others that are not coming to mind at the moment. But so that's kind of how I started. Those are all pretty formidable. 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 <laughs> it's funny, I met one time one of the head of, heads of marketing for Ford at, the, at a lounge in the airport, and he was talking to me about mindfulness. I wonder if you worked with him. I don't know. Very funny. Yeah. I'll have to find his card. He was such a nice man. Um, from the corporations, I wish, by the way, that uh, more people could afford to just have you come privately, because what a gift that would be for you to walk into the house in the morning and just like create the space for meditation so that somebody doesn't feel like they have to do it themselves. There's something really magical about that. I taught after teaching privately for a long time. I realize now the benefit of it, and I might hire a private yoga teacher just for fun. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> just once a week, just come yeah. on over and walk me through it. Tell me what to do. Yeah. Go ahead. And it's so nice, oh, my God, being the teacher and having somebody come over and tell you what to do. <clears throat> it gets tiring to tell everybody else what to do. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> so, so, and you're now teaching. Tell us where you're teaching now and what's your favorite Um, Right now I teach at a place called The Assemblage, which is Mm -hmm. a membership club and our work membership place. And I teach there. Um, And then I also see all my privates there. And then I also teach at the MoMA a couple times a year at something called Quiet Mornings, where you've taught too. Right. And then um, at the moment I'm also teaching on the first live meditation app that's coming out. Live Meditation I, yes, app. Yes, 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 yes. Wow, Live what a meditation. feat that is uh, technologically. Technologically, I'm sure they're having a hard time. But I don't know what their problems are, but I feel like I'm having a hard time. Um, it's such a new way of teaching for me, and it's for sure. been a, a real opportunity to grow as a teacher. Um, yeah, it's called Journey Live. Journey Live. Live. Yep. And How do we find it online? On the Apple App Store, Apple Podcasts. I don't think it's a podcast. I think it's oh, just it's an on app. the App Store. Pardon, yeah, pardon, pardon. Okay. And then um, it is yeah. You just download it there, and the lo- the official launch is um, at the end of this month. So, are people paying for the app? They will be pl- paying for the app right now. You can join beta if you just use my name, Gemma, in all caps, G E M M A. You can log in. Okay, and so there's... go to the Journey Live app, log in using the word Gemma, all caps, G-E-M-M-A, and you'll get in beta for free. Yep, and then you'll have the program for a year. That's a big deal. That's a great gift. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going in. <laughs> You're going to do it? it. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so it's cool. We have teachers lined up at several times during the day, and right. then you just log into the app, and a few minutes before your scheduled time. Ding. Yep, and then all of a sudden there's a teacher and there's a little cute, like little, like, you know, you sign in and your name pops up and other people's names pop up and you get to say what you're grateful for and acknowledge each other. Oh gosh. So it's really cool. But it's also such a difference being a teacher. I'm so used to being and feeling and experiencing and using my intuition and using my emotional intelligence in order to inform and allow that connection to happen. Right. And now I'm teaching to a camera. 
um, and a screen right. where I see people's names. So it's been a big adjustment and a shift, but really exciting because I'm starting now. It's been a few weeks that I've been teaching. Um, there's question and answer section afterwards. That's so nice. you start seeing the same names pop up on the board and right. then you see the same people asking questions and having experiences right. and they're sharing them. So it's really, really interesting. I have um, a lot, almost 20, no, 10 years teaching to a camera. On Glow. Yes. I was actually hoping we would talk about that a little bit. I was just thinking it might be nice to say this because it's helped me a lot, which is behind that little dot, and you really have to look at the dot. You can't look at the screen. Mm -hmm. But behind that little dot are legions of people who are really just seeking some guidance, some comfort, some help. And I think yeah. the modern day intuitive jungle gym of your life is to feel into the people in the dot mm. and actually use your emotional intelligence with them mm -hmm. in the moment. Mm -hmm. Here's the craziest part is that you're doing it live so you can actually do that. Mm -hmm. I have to do it like a time bending exercise where I'm doing it into a camera that's recording that's going to be later mm -hmm. released to those folks. So I'm doing it sort of into the future, mm -hmm. which is a total mind bend. Mm -hmm. But I love it mm -hmm. because it's really like looking into the camera and loving people through that one mm -hmm. little dot. Yeah. I find it to be such a privilege. It's so good. Yep. And I, I for me, it was at the beginning, I was really, really nervous. I can imagine. And I was thinking to myself, you know, why am I nervous about it? I like called a couple of my best girlfriends and I'm like, I'm just so nervous about this thing. And there's a camera and I don't know. And I'm like fighting against <laughs> it. And then I was just like, Oh, I'm scared to be judged. Yes. And then I was like, okay, so why are you scared to be judged? And then I started to realize how this fear of being judged turns into me wanting to control the way people think about me. Which is such a funny Whoa. thing that I do. Dude, we all do. I know. And then I was like, oh. And then I just had to laugh at myself and think, oh, well, that's impossible. <laughs> you know, it's funny. And I, then that just left and that dot, I started to shift that and started to experience the camera in the same way that you're suggesting. Good. And now I start my practice um, closed eye and saying a prayer for everybody who's going to be there. That's right. Yep. And a prayer for myself to get out of the way for the truth to come through. So, well, we can close this podcast right now. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> Scene. So to the meditation and yoga teachers who are listening, we're with you 100%. <laughs> this is all for you. Yeah. I just realized that's who this is for. Yeah. Uh, what I'll say is I think sometimes when I'm afraid to be judged, it's because I've spent some modicum of time and energy judging other people too mm -hmm. and so that also had to still has to i have it still come up at times but it, i have to constantly be uh excising that cleaning that mm. out of my field mm -hmm. so that i can just be present for what's happening without worrying about what people think about me and totally. i just mm. but it's very real you know the whole world is now kind of a a forum Mm. a camera mm. and a and an end game mm. and we're all kind of out there mm. whether you teach yoga meditation or you don't whether mm -hmm. you teach anything or you don't you're still putting yourself out there if you want to and mm. it's it's a thing mm -hmm. that feeling of being judged it's a thing yeah and it's such a gift to be able to be able to be on camera and offering teachings like this because yeah you know we have people in europe and in japan that tune in and um, people in smaller towns that necessarily don't have access to what we're doing here in New York and what we're doing here in New York, I think is pretty interesting as far as meditation and, um, it's special to be able to share that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think that the, the work that we get to do here in this town, especially is so centralized and so well received because people have, you know, experienced it before and they're so happy to just be led but i know that it's time to spread it more mm. you know widespread mm -hmm. yeah yeah i recently had um so we mentioned my husband sasha lewis he has something called quiet mornings um which is a meditation 
and art experience at the MoMA once a month. And recently a, a woman from Japan came up to me after and, and we had a tea after and we talked about her needs and what she wanted. And she was really interested in what she kept talking about is the way we're doing it in New York. She wants to bring that back to Japan. It's funny. And she was referring to like, you know, the way that we're thinking about mindfulness, the way that we're teaching mindfulness and meditation in this modern way. And she said that it was really interesting for her. She wanted to bring that back to Japan for the younger generations. And so that was the moment that I realized like, oh, we're doing something different or interest, you know, like of interest to other people. Yeah. Kind of cool. I wonder what that means. I wonder, yeah. I wonder what makes our way mo more modern for her or more accessible. I guess it's just the languaging. I think it's the languaging. And I think it's also the presentation and the tradition around it because I think that Japan has such a history and tradition around meditation. Right. That I, it sounds like um, the dogma might get uh, in the way of it uh, landing for the younger generation. That makes sense. I, that was my understanding, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and for people to be picking up on what what is being done elsewhere and to want to bring that sort of energy. Super cool. And have you taught in other countries? Do you feel like there's a big difference Place to place? I haven't taught in different countries. No. No. Okay, just here. Just here. And yeah. do you teach at any studios at all? No, I don't teach at any studios. Incredible. So Journey Live is really where we get to find you. Oh, I'm going to be starting to teach at The Well. Oh, that's nice. Where is that? The Well is, uh, is it's not open yet. It's opening July 1st. Okay. It's um, in Midtown on 20th, no, not in Midtown, like Flatiron, 20th Street. Okay, got it. And that's... An integral health center. So they're bringing together um, Western and Eastern traditions of healing practices right. yeah. into one facility. Cool. Yeah. So there'll be sports doctors and yoga teachers and meditation teachers and acupuncturists and Western doctors. So there'll be more of a holistic approach to health and offering for people to come. And I don't know about you. Well, I'm sure that you too, but like, you know, I have my, all my different doctors from different lineage practices and traditions and cultures and I'm always moving around to different places yeah. to find them and the idea of this place is that they all come together in one place right yeah very smart mm -hmm. the well it's called mm -hmm. okay yeah the well I'll have a look out for it yeah and when it comes to your own practice tell us mm -hmm. about what your rituals are your morning your afternoon whatever you do with your meditation practice I always love to learn um, my meditation practice, I feel like is so simple and basic. I wake up in the morning and, um, I meditate. <laughs> I like wash my face, sit down and I meditate. And, you know, at this point I, I, I can kind of already have a sense of, um, my feelings and my state of consciousness. And I give myself and prescribe myself different things. Um, like for example, today I woke up and I, there's a lot of conflict within me, so um, I could see that conflict um, going right into my practice, and there was this kind of fight. So the first thing I did was pranayama. I did a breathing exercise, and that kind of helped me just find a little inlet, a little space to mm -hmm. kind of get in there and soften qu quicker. What was um, the breathing exercise? I did breath of fire. Yeah. So smart. And then um, in the afternoon, at this point, I'm meditating many times a day with clients. Yes. So I don't always necessarily have my own afternoon or evening practice because I would have already meditated quite a bit during the yes. day. Yes. <laughs> it's probably better not to meditate more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the afternoon, I find if I meditate and it's too late, uh -huh. I can't sleep. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's pretty normal. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because so many people are always thinking that meditation before bed is ideal oh, well i mean maybe a certain kind of yoga nidra that would lay you out and let you let you go to mm, sleep right. but yoga nidra even is really meant to revitalize you mm -hmm. also it's so funny um breath of fire if you're listening and you don't know what breath of fire happens to be it's a very fast rapid repeated exhalation out through the nostrils almost like you're blowing a candle out with your nose that clears your sinus passage your respiratory system and also your mind 
And it's a really nice practice to do when, particularly as Gemma was saying, when there's conflict or some sort of strife within you, it's a really nice reset button on all of it. Sort mm. of like a workout without going and having a workout. Yeah. Very nice. And do you and Sasha meditate together? We do, yes. Oh, that's so cute. We do. It is very oh, cute. Oh, God. It is really amazing to have a partner who had already established his own practice and his own center and his own, done all of his own work before we met so that uh, it wasn't something that we had to negotiate for or push. We just, that space was both already there for both of us. It was really nice to share that with him. Yeah, I can imagine. For yeah. for women to not have to teach their men, for men not to have to, mm -hmm. have to teach their women, that's really nice. Yeah, it is nice, yeah. Yeah, we say prayers together every morning and... We have um, a book of spirit, like a, a daily diary that mm. we read a beautiful script from every day together. It's so sweet. It is sweet. Gosh. <laughs> you know, getting married when you're a little older is a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Something in me knew that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I, I have this series of three questions that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast. Okay. I'm curious to s mention them to you. The first one is what in your life or space needs healing right now? Mm, my relationship with my sister. Oh, wow. Well. Mm, yeah, that's a big and heavy one, but that's the one. Yeah, that needs healing in my life right now. Is she older or younger? She's 13 months younger. Yeah, I have the same. You do? Yes, and it took us a long time. It took basically, I mean, we were both making efforts for the last probably 10 years, but when my mom died is kind of when we, as James said, we zipped up like a sweater. Oh, it's the opposite for my sister and I. She died and you guys went separate she, ways. Our father died. Oh, boy. Yeah. And, um, I mean, th there's, there's so much there, and it's really interesting, but... Uh, we both had very complex relationships with our father. Mm. Um, my father had a very complex life. Mm. And um, as a result, I think there was a lot going on between us that we had no idea about, which I'm sure is, you know, what you're relating to and telling me from your sister. Yeah. And um, talk about, it's just so hard to see through it all. It's like, oh my gosh, there's just no space to see through it. And I try and... I, th I know she has tried, and um, it's just, it's all this stuff that's kind of still there. Yeah. Yeah. My coach, uh, Lauren Zander, she had me do hmm. a rewrite, mm -hmm. basically. I sat down, and it was like this one half hour moment in 48 years of my life. At the time, I was probably 44. And I rewrote the energy of the relationship with my sister on a piece of paper. Mm, the energy, that's what's interesting. I basically, I didn't, it wasn't like I made up things, although I was basically redesigning the energy that I felt for her. Mm. I have to say, I didn't rewrite any events that happened. I'm not forgetting about the events that happened. Like mm. I was an asshole. She was kind of a jerk too, but I was really the one who initiated all the all the nonsense and was playing the victim. Mm. I mean, really fascinating stuff, and I couldn't see it until I worked with Lauren, and she helped me see all the fabrications in my life. But anyway, the point is, I rewrote the energy of my relationship with her, and guess what? Mm -hmm. One 30-minute sit-down of writing, and all of a sudden, I was a different person with her. Mm -hmm. She didn't see what I wrote. Yeah. She'll never see what I wrote. I don't even know where it is, but in rewriting it and experiencing the potential of having this very soft, supportive, solid relationship with her, mm -hmm. everything changed. Mm -hmm. I've never been the same with her since. That's so amazing. It's weird. And then Lauren challenged me. She said, oh yeah, she said, uh, why don't you go ahead and date your sister? Meaning... Mm -hmm. When you're dating somebody, you're always very conscious of how you are. You're texting, you're in contact, you're, you know, doing all the things that you would do if you really gave a shit about somebody. Yeah. And at the time I was like, I don't want to do that. And I started to do it just because I'm such a competitive freak and I wanted to please my coach and, mm -hmm. you know, show her that I could yeah. do it. And sure enough, 
It was completely authentic. There was nothing made up or fabricated about it. It was actually my heart wanting to reach out to this person who we, we share such a history. And I love, love texting with her. I love reaching out to her. I love talking to her on the phone. It's like some oasis in the middle of my day. And I will never stop thanking Lauren and her work mm-hmm. and the Handel Method for, for that for that instruction because it changed everything for me. And I dare say, I mostly remember on my podcast, but here's an assignment for you. If you're listening, pick a relationship that sucks. Like someone close to you. It just sucks. You're, you know, don't worry about who's to blame because you've been a jerk and so have they, or they've been a serious, serious jerk and you've just kind of rolled over and whatever the case, take a pen and a piece of paper. Don't type it into your stupid phone. Or your computer, (laughs) damn it. (laughs) Get a pen and a piece of paper and write down the energy of this relationship in the absolute ideal. She and I get along. Not only do we get along, we support each other, we're there for each other, we nurture each other, we take care of each other uh, in whatever ways that we can. And make it up as you go. It's like you're you're in the emotional playground and you get to design whatever you want. Absolutely. I love that. I love it too. Um, okay, great. So, so that's what you're working on. The second question is sort of more fun and playful. What is your favorite view? My favorite view? Yeah. What do you mean? Like view? It can mean anything. Oh, it can mean anything. Oh, great. I've gotten so many various answers that I love asking the question Uh because I never know where it's going to go. Uh, my favorite view is two part. It's through my hands and through my heart. That's a great answer, dude. <laughs> That's a great answer. Tell oh, me more. Yeah. Tell me more. Um, um, because I see life um, kind of almost like, uh, you know, we can see it through lenses, mm-hmm. you know, and when I can see life through the lens of my heart, uh, there's just a feeling of, um, beauty and purity that I really, really enjoy. It's like just the best. And then, um, everyone looks good through that lens. <laughs> yeah. Everybody does look good. It's so yeah. nice. Rose colored glasses. <laughs> exactly. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, my hands, uh, I just really love watching, um, my hands take action. Mm. I love to paint and draw and uh, cook and make anything with my hands. Uh, I, I just, I love watching that. And I, I think of, you know, I've been painting a lot recently. I just got a studio. No way. Which, yeah. Wait, and, that's very inspiring to me. Go on. Tell me more about that. Well, it's Where? a 20 year dream and it's here. <sighs> thrived wow. in Gowanus. Oh my God, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, very near to my house. So you have a space where you can only paint. Where I can only paint and draw and do whatever I want. Wow, dude. It's beautiful and it's in really like the coolest part of Gowanus. So there's a lot of really interesting action going on. Yep. Things, just people doing cool things. And um, yeah, and I also, uh, I graduated from um, the Art Institute of Chicago with my BFA. And Good for you. Oh, yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I always wanted to have a studio, but life kind of took me in this direction with fashion. Yeah. And the time is here now. So I signed up for a painting class at SVA, which is amazing. That's so good on 23rd Street. Yeah. The, I go to the studio on 21st. Yep. Great. And so we're there. And then I go and I paint. And, you know, for me, um, one of my practices in teaching, actually, when I do big events and things like that is... Mm. I paint a painting for each person that comes as a gift and a reminder for our experience together. Wow. And it's also an opportunity for me to share another practice with people. And that is really allowing my heart to move through my hands. So for me, um, you know, how do we take the action of meditation into the world, right? Really? Why are we doing this? Are we doing it because we heard meditation helps us with our focus and we can be more productive and we can be more, you know, all those things? Or are we doing it because we want to live for, live from our hearts, live from our spirit, live from our soul? And for me, that's that's my intention. That's why I wanted to start to meditate. 
But um, so how do we bring that practice of, of sitting with our, our heart or our deepest part of ourselves and bring that into the world? Um, drawing and painting was always an easy space for me to explore in order to watch myself do that where mm-hmm. I'm taking action without thought, you know, I'm taking right. action, um, from a place of, we were talking about judgment earlier, but from discernment instead of judgment, um, where I take action from un- my knowing instead of my thinking. Mm. Yeah. So painting is, is an amazing way for me to be able to practice being present and, um, making choices from presence. I got nothing after that. That's beautiful. And it sort of is actually the perfect segue into the third question, which your husband actually, when he answered it, he mentioned you with great fondness and said that you were a teacher to him of this. What does prayer mean to you? Mm. I ask everyone the same question. Oh, I'm uh, glad I opened up with a prayer. It's so sweet. Yeah. Um, Prayer to me is... um, is realizing that we're in co-creation with, with the divine. So, you know, when you really look at prayer from a mystical level, you see how um, all the mystics were saying things like, let this be, mm. you know, let this be, let this happen. And I think prayer is this, the time where we really connect to our heart's desire and we allow the divine to know what is in our heart of hearts, our most true, truest desire. And um, we ask for that to happen. And when we do that and, and we're going where there, there needs to be, at least for me in prayer, there, there, there is a, there's a part of surrendering the desire, you know, because you're, I'm giving it to the divine. I'm saying like, here, this is what is in my heart. This is what I want. Can you help me? Can you do this? Can you take this from me? You know, this pain is so heavy. Can you lift it for me? So there's this practice of surrendering. So in that surrendering, we quickly learn that we are in co-creation with the divine, that we only manifest when we know what is our most connected desire. And then we allow the divine to take us. We look for the clues. We look for the doorways, the avenues to move, move into that direction of the desire Or, or it doesn't happen. And we realize, Oh, that's not part of the master plan. Yeah, wrong path. Mm-hmm. Moving on. Mm-hmm. Door closes, another one opens. Exactly. As this podcast is based on transitions, this is my last question. Mm. Is there any uh, part of your life that you feel you could use as a teaching on the concept of transition, current, past, or maybe even future? Transition. Yeah. Uh, one specific experience that I had that taught me more about transition the um you know I I think becoming aware in the moment that a transition is happening is probably one of the most helpful things (laughs) yeah that's true because once we can see oh this is a transition then we notice um we notice our opportunities to take action more um or to not take action right um I guess transitions, I guess there's like a, like I've learned how, you know, it's really just control and certainty and this ability to be able to be really soft through all of it. Mm. You know, I think when I'm experiencing a lot of my own practice and my practice feeling more kind of like open eyed is like when I arrive, which part of me is arriving and over the past several months, I've been noticing it's a different part. Wow. It's like this part of myself that is that witness part or the watcher is, um, is really the one showing up more without all those other layers. So it makes it easier to experience transitions because I'm not as concerned with uncertainty. Um, the not being concerned with uh, uncertainty is a pretty great gift to, to receive from the universe, from aging. Yeah. You know? Oh, my God. Yeah. Phew. Yes. 
<laughs> but I love that you're actually, you're quite young and you have this very mature perspective on things that impresses me, mm. which is why I asked you to be on this thing. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like you are an old lady <laughs> in, a, <laughs> in a very tall young body, <laughs> which makes me happy for you. Mm. There's so much more to come and you know you have so much wisdom already. So Thank you. Yeah, yeah bravissima. Grazie. Mm. <laughs> anything else that you'd like to share? Um, anything I'd like to share? Um, I can't think of anything. Perfect. Yeah. We're going to find you on Journey Live. Yes. We're going to use all caps G-E-M-M-A when we go to the app store and find Journey Live. Yes. And we're going to get in for free for a year. Yes. And that is going to be a very big treat for many of I th- us. I think it's a year. It's definitely a year if you sign up before April um 30th so we'll see if after Great. what happens okay yeah, you can also find me on instagram you can find me on my website let's go into your instagram it's Gemma g-e-m-m-a gamby g-a-m-b-e-e lewis l-e-w-i-s Gemma gamby lewis yes one word yes and okay, then great. my website is www.gemmagamby.com beautiful mm. and again that's g-e-m-m-a G-A-M-B-E-E. Yes. What a pleasure. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. I'm going to have you back again soon in a few months. Okay. I want to keep hearing from you. Thank you. I can't wait to sit with you again. For sure. For sure. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Do you want to take us through like a five-minute meditation just in case people would be interested? Yes. Let's do it. Let's do a contemplative meditation. I love it. Great. Mm. Readjusting. Yeah. Yes, we, we are readjusting. So. You can take a nice, comfortable seat. Just find yourself wherever you are. That's perfect. Settling in. Set the phone down if you're listening on the phone. Hmm. So contemplative meditations, in case you're not familiar, is when you allow yourself to invoke a sensation through either repeating the word or remembering or recalling an experience that invoked the feeling or sensation. So... The word and the concept, the spiritual feeling that I'd like to suggest you use and we use in this moment is tenderness. Oh. (laughs) I just melted. (laughs) Yeah, so we're just going to take a moment now to close our eyes. It'll just be about five minutes. So just letting your eyes come closed. If that means you want to take a big deep inhale do that let's inhale through our nose and then exhale through the mouth and then just noticing your attention first what is your attention engaged with it doesn't matter what it is engaged with just notice notice without any judgment And let's go ahead and bring our attention to our seat and just notice the body sitting or standing wherever it is that you are. And then go ahead and allow yourself to invoke the sensation of tenderness. You can do that by reminding yourself of an experience you've had being tender with a person, an animal, a place, nature. Or if you want, you can allow the word tender to gently repeat inside of yourself. And then once you start to really have that sensation in your center, that sensation of tenderness, allow the concept to fall away. Allow the sensation to remain.
If you find yourself drifting into thought, just notice without judgment. No big deal. It's part of the process. And then use tenderness to bring your attention back. Back to this experience of your own tenderness. Now see if you can allow that sensation of tenderness to start to spread. Move through you. Allow it to spread beyond, beyond your body. Allow your attention to fully engage, fully engage with your sense of tenderness. Okay. So keeping your eyes closed, let's go ahead and let go of the meditation. Allowing that sensation of tenderness to remain, but starting to allow your attention to shift. Maybe starting to notice that connection your seat has with your cushion or your feet have with the ground. Noticing the presence of your body, wherever you may be. And then when you're ready, go ahead and allow your eyes to just gently start to open. Maybe just about halfway. And then when you're ready, go ahead and allow them to open up all the way. Dude, I was gone. <laughs> Like, straight up gone. I could have gone on there for another 20 minutes easily. I didn't realize you were going to make me laugh and giggle so Sorry. much. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I My should have every pleasure. teacher teach meditation on here. That was really stunning. I can't tell you. Thank you. Oh, my great pleasure. Thank you. You're really good. It's nice to bring uh, contemplative meditation to the forefront. I haven't really done that. I always I meditate with my mantra, my mala. That's mm. all I do. I just, boom, I get into the rhythm and that's it. I'm gone for 20 minutes. Mm. That was really nice. Mm. And the way at the end, if I may, the, the, the full engagement of my attention with tenderness meant something to me that was really mm. helpful. What did you experience? What did, what did you discover? What did it mean to you? Everything fell away. I felt like I was in a tunnel time warp mm. literally there was nothing else but mm. that your voice and that action of full engagement really nice <sighs> yeah so good. hands up hats yeah. off clothes off <laughs> <laughs> well done lady well oh, done of it's a pleasure to have you thank you for having me yeah. Lena. thank you for being here my pleasure okay